Good morning and welcome to worship at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church. My name is Sam Jeske. I have the joy and privilege of serving as the pastor at Our Shepherd Lutheran Church, a Christ-centered, mission-minded congregation located in the region of Northwest Indiana, and uh, um, proud and privileged to proclaim the good news that we have in Jesus. Um, it's a good thing that you're able to join us today. Um, maybe there's a lot of snow uh, by your house, and maybe there's not a whole lot. Maybe driving is rather treacherous. Whatever your situation might be, what a joy it is that we have the ability and we have the gifts and resources that God has given us in this digital day and age that we could still meet for worship today. Maybe not physically the way that we would want to, but we could nevertheless meet still together and worship our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, I'm old enough that I remember the day before the internet, and chances are a lot of you probably remember that day too. Um, you Gen Z folk probably cannot even picture a time before the internet because it's always been there for you. But when, when we would get eight plus inches of snow, what did that mean for a Sunday worship service? It was canceled, right? <laughs> there was no worship service that day. Everybody was stuck at home, <laughs> shoveling out their cars, shoveling out the sidewalk. They weren't going anywhere, and as a result, we, we weren't able to, to meet. I know as we are going into nearly an entire year of a lot of behavioral changes and modification as a result of COVID-19 and so social distancing, and yes, even the protocol and the safety implementations that we've put in at Our Shepherd, I know that all of these things month after month, now going into a year, can start to frustrate you. And that frustration, it starts to show itself in a lot of ways. We start to get impatient with each other. We start to grumble and to groan and complain because this isn't how we want things to be. And I get that. But as you look outside your window and you see eight plus inches of snow that, that's kind of boxed you in and you're huddled by, you know, in your blanket with your cup of coffee and your, your nice fireplace or the furnace that's keeping your house warm and you are able to watch this worship service, let's thank God for that. Let's thank God for the gifts and talents or the gifts and, and, and treasures that he's given us that allows us to still rejoice in who our Savior is even if we're meeting virtually that the message of the good news of Jesus, our Savior from sin, we can still rejoice in that message, and that message can be shared in ways that we couldn't at one time before. And on this Sunday, um, four Sundays after the Epiphany, that's going to be our focus again today, as we're again rejoicing in the theme of seeing the for you in Christ. Today we're going to see that Jesus, the promised prophet, the great prophet who was to come, he speaks with power, and he does so for you. May God bless us as we meditate on his word in worship today. with clouds descending once for every sinner slain thousand thousand saints attending swell the triumph of his train Christ reveals his endless reign. Every eye shall now be old him, robed in glorious majesty. Who ridiculed and sold him, pierced and nailed him to the 
tree Deeply wailing, deeply wailing Shall the true Messiah see of his passion still in dazzling body bears cause of endless exaltation to his ransom worshippers In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him, and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him, and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let's go to our God in prayer. Lord God, you know that we are surrounded by many dangers and that we often stumble and fall. Strengthen us in body and mind and bring us safely through all temptations. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The section of Scripture that will serve as the focus of our meditation this morning comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 1. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. 
come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching and with authority? He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. It's an unsettling sight to imagine, isn't it? A man possessed by a demon, ranting and raving in the middle of a house of worship. But Mark isn't recording a tall tale or a Mediterranean myth. This actually happened. On a real Sabbath day, in a real synagogue, in the real Galilean city of Capernaum. Believe it or not, Satan is real. He's not some cartoonish character sitting on your shoulder with his little red jumpsuit and plastic horns and a plastic pitchfork. The Bible compares him to that of a, a roaring lion prowling around on the hunt looking for someone to devour, including you. That's the kind of devil that we see in Mark chapter 1 in the middle of that synagogue. But that's not all we see in this real story. And the kicking and screaming of Satan isn't all we hear either. We hear Jesus. And he speaks with power. Those people in the synagogue that day who were sitting in that semicircle fashion, watching and listening to Jesus, they would tell you the exact same thing. They were amazed at how Jesus preached. But Mark also makes a point to tell us, the reader, not just how Jesus preached, but how Jesus didn't <laughs> preach. He didn't preach like the scribes. It wasn't that Jesus was more charismatic than they were. It wasn't that Jesus incorporated loads of catchy hooks or funny anecdotes or lots of pop culture references, and, and these scribes never did. That's not what Mark is getting at. There was something that their message didn't have that Jesus' message did have. Their message didn't have authority. The Greek word in the context that's set before us today isn't authority in terms of status or position. The scribes had that after all, didn't they? They had earned it. These were men of the Jewish community who had undergone rigorous education already from a young age, enrolling in what is referred to in Hebrew as a Beit Midrash, a house of study. And under that house's teacher, they would learn astronomy in order to determine religious holidays and festivals. They studied mathematics, accounting, basic business, natural sciences, and basic law. And as their title suggests, not only did they not only were they trained in transcribing the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, but they were also trained on how to teach those sections of Scripture too. Yet always in line and in view of rabbinic tradition. These men were seen and declared ordained scholars who had earned the title of rabbi, teacher, in other words, these scribes, they were the intelligentsia of the Jewish religious community. They were the experts. Yet in spite of all their knowledge, in everything that they've learned and all that they studied, in spite of their prestigious status among the Jewish people, there was something that the scribes' message didn't have that Jesus' message did have. 
and that was authority. Jesus preached with power. Mark merely isn't noting that Jesus as God was perfect and the scribes were, were not, which is true. That, that's, that's not merely what Mark is trying to communicate here with this comparison. Uh, nor is Mark merely observing that, that Jesus as God knew vastly more about God's word than these educated scribes did, which is totally true because he's God after all. It wasn't that Jesus' rhetoric demonstrated a command and capability and the scribes couldn't talk to save their lives. Well, they, they knew how to talk and, and they liked to talk. What Mark is getting at is that there was something not just different but off about the scribes' message. And when Jesus stood side by side with them, when, when Jesus stood next to these self-righteous religious elites, the people could see that too. When Jesus spoke, he blew them out of the water. The people said, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. But here's the sad thing. It wasn't new. This new teaching was the beating heart of all of Scripture. This new teaching could already be seen in the prophetic visions of Isaiah and Jeremiah. This new teaching, you could, you could already hear it in the music and the poetry of the Psalms. This new teaching, it had already been foreshadowed in the Levitical priesthood with the sacrificing of the, of the Passover lamb for the sins of, of the community. That new teaching had already been promised to a fallen, broken world in the Garden of Eden, recorded for the people to read already in the first few pages of the Bible, that the Son of God would suffer and die to rescue a broken, fallen world that was powerless, totally, utterly powerless to save itself. God loved that world that much. That new teaching wasn't new at all. But those people thought it was new. And they thought it was new because they never heard it from the pulpit. Jesus, in this sermon, that day, that Sabbath at the synagogue, Jesus powerfully exposed an evident disconnect between what the scribes were saying and what the Bible said. There was something so essential, so purely biblical, that Jesus was saying that the scribes weren't. And that something was powerful. That something was the gospel. The good news of God. The good news of God's coming deliverance in his long-awaited promised prophet, this Messiah who would come. The good news of Jesus, the Holy Lamb of God. God in flesh, who in love had come to seek and save a lost and dying world that had joined Satan in his rebellion against God. We couldn't pull ourselves up out of the mess that our sins had made. So Jesus, in love for us, he dove headlong into our mess to save and rescue us. That's the gospel. Your Savior lived a perfect life for you because we couldn't. He died the death that we deserved so that we wouldn't. All to win for us those who cling to him in faith, entry into the mansions of paradise and a right and reconciled relation with him. That is the message that the world needs to hear. But Satan, he doesn't want that. Since the fall into sin, Satan, he has been working overtime trying to drag as much of God's creation into hell with him. So when Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, 
the Savior of the world, the Son of God, when he entered this world, go figure. His arrival stirred up the hornet nest of hell. And Satan knew who Jesus was. Satan knew why Jesus had come and what Jesus had come to do. Satan knew that Jesus had come to free us from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil. That Jesus had come to crush the head of Satan. (laughs) To crush the head of the serpent who had dragged God's creation into rebellion with him. And in order for Jesus to accomplish that mission, it meant going to war with Satan. And so Satan, he marshaled his forces and he threw everything that he had against Jesus, all to sabotage Christ's saving mission. And that's exactly what we see in our story today, isn't it? The devil's objective was not only to shut Jesus down, but to shout him out. Jesus' gospel sermon, his gospel sermon is suddenly and abruptly interrupted by a man who is possessed by one of Satan's minions, one of Satan's demons. What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. As weird as it sounds, Satan liked the sermons that had been preached at that synagogue. He liked the sermons that diminished the stark reality that we fallen, broken sinners don't have the power to save or rescue ourselves. Satan liked the sermons that preach a a work-based theology, a work-righteous system where we're taught as long as you're obedient enough, devoted enough, faithful enough, committed enough, You can earn God's love and win entry for yourself into his heaven. Satan knows that should I try to justify myself before God by my observance of God's law, I'll only end up furthering or further estranging myself from God and his grace. And that's exactly what Satan wants. That's what he wants. He wants to make an eternal hellside companion out of me. And you too. And what better way for him to do just that than to slowly and silently set up shop in the church. Hijack the church's mission. And push Christ and his life-giving gospel from center stage. The other day, I had, a, I had a conversation with a guy who told me he was leaving his church after many years going there because he couldn't stay at a congregation that so frequently neglected to preach the gospel. The forgiveness of sins on account of Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. And while I rejoiced that God had, by his word, worked in him a heart that listens to his voice and rejoices in his gospel. My mind sadly remembered a lot of conversations with people who were clearly listening to a different message. Maybe it's a prosperity gospel where God is reduced to nothing more than this divine cash cow, this sugar daddy in the sky, this, this godly vending machine. Or maybe it's a social gospel where Jesus is demoted from Savior of the world, the spiritual Savior, to nothing more than a glorified philanthropist, this champion of political and social, even economic reform. Or maybe the gospel's been entirely gutted like universalism, for example, which teaches that everyone is going to heaven because what loving God would take sin seriously? Or, or maybe it's far more subtle where the fine print of the message that people are taught and people are preached, it tells you that God's free grace actually isn't free. 
that you got to earn it. That you got to work for it. That you got to deserve it. Now, salvation isn't free. You still got to do something, they tell you. But it's in the fine print. Or maybe they tell you that, sure, Jesus died on, a, on the cross, but his death didn't cover every sin. Jesus' life and ministry and his work, his saving work, it didn't pay for all of your sins. And there's the devil. There's the devil in the details. Folks walk into these houses of worship burdened by a world of full of demanding to-do lists. But they don't walk out of those houses of worship feeling comforted, feeling uplifted or encouraged or forgiven or absolved for the guilt that weighs on their heart. No, they walk out with more to-do lists, more things that you need to do. (laughs) They walk in feeling like a failure. They walk in feeling broken, beaten, and bloodied from the battlefield of waging war with Satan and their sinful nature. And they walk out feeling just as beaten, broken, and bloodied as they had when they walked in. And they still feel like a failure. I must not be trying hard enough, they say to themselves. I must not be a real Christian because a real Christian wouldn't still be struggling with these same sins. When Satan uses people within the church, be it the church leadership or the church membership, to push Christ and his pure, powerful gospel aside, the church, the place that should be, that was intended to be the triage for the sin-sick soul, becomes a museum for venerating the self-righteous. People stumble into such houses spiritually starving and they fumble out of them just as hungry if not hungrier than they were before. Uh, But Satan isn't just looking to set up shop in your church. No, he's looking to set up shop elsewhere too. Satan would love nothing more than to set up shop in your home. Isn't it peculiar how even during a pandemic when so much of our past routine is canceled, we still find ourselves too busy to be in God's word regularly. Or maybe it's when we're completely comfortable during a pandemic dining out at our favorite restaurants or completely comfortable attending our favorite movie theaters or completely comfortable uh, going to our favorite social clubs, attending our favorite community events or going to our favorite restaurants or going to our favorite bars or going to our favorite stores. We're completely comfortable with all of that. But when it comes to attending worship services, when it comes to being rooted in Christian community, then suddenly... We can't because of COVID. Suddenly, I'm not comfortable. Suddenly, we're too busy. There's a disconnect there, isn't it? And that disconnect, it does communicate something. When you and I, we're very hasty and quick to, we're, to, to make time for all this other stuff, our jobs, our social life, our activities, and we're completely comfortable going out to stores and going out to restaurants and doing all these other things in our life. But when it comes to being rooted in God's word and in Christian community and being strengthened and nourished by God's means of grace, and suddenly I'm not comfortable and I'm too busy, there is a disconnect there, isn't there? And that disconnect, it communicates something. And not just to the community around us that are watching us as Christians right now, but it communicates something to our families too, those closest to us. It communicates that God and his word aren't important. Or at the very least, they aren't more important than my life, my job, my social activities. 
When we neglect to sit down with our spouse or our children and meditate on God's word and be enriched and nourished by the living waters of his promises embedded therein, from page to page, there is our God nourishing us. When we neglect to carve aside time in our busy lives to reroot our families, reroot our relationships in God's gospel, in his word, when talking about Jesus and his gospel isn't intentionally shared by congregations, but is instead relegated by a church and a family to just one hour on one day during any given week. We are communicating something, aren't we? We're communicating to one another that the good news of Jesus really isn't important. We're communicating that the good news of Jesus Christ and his gospel isn't significant or powerful. That Christ and his saving gospel, they're optional, not absolutely essential. And all the while, Satan laughs. But the devil doesn't get the last word. Jesus does. Jesus won't share the microphone with Satan. And Jesus won't take endorsement from the father of lies either. <laughs> so Jesus told him to shut up and get lost. And that's exactly what happened in Mark chapter 1. Because Jesus speaks with power. Jesus speaks in a man whose mind was imprisoned was set free. Jesus speaks and all of hell shakes. Satan may be your God's enemy, but that doesn't make Satan God's rival. That, that, that would be giving Satan way too much credit. To call Satan God's rival gives the impression that, that Satan stands a chance against God's power. And he never did. He never will. He can kick and scream all he wants, but he has lost. He may be no quitter, but he is still a loser. Christ still crushed the head of that serpent on, by his death on the cross, by Jesus' death on the cross for you. Satan marshaled everything that he had and he threw all that he could at Jesus to try and trip him up and sabotage Christ's saving agenda, his saving work, and he failed. Christ won. Your God, he died to deliver you. Mission accomplished your God endured hell so heaven would be your home. Your God, by his blood, he pried the filthy, grimy, accusing hands of Satan off of you and set you free from the bondage of sin and death forever. Why? All this he did. All of that your Savior did for you. He kept all of God's law perfectly for you. He suffered the fullness of our punishment on the cross. He did all of that for you so that you would be his. So that you would be his own. So that you would live under him in his kingdom forever. Your God loves you that much. Your Savior's words, it is finished, that he proclaimed confidently and sufficiently from the cross, those words objectively reverberate through all of time. They still echo today for the world to hear. And his empty tomb does the same. That's why the Apostle Paul says, and why you and I can say with him, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? For it is the power of God. The power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. 
that gospel word of power is proclaimed to you every single Sunday as you are assured in Christ that your sins are completely and fully and freely forgiven. That gospel word of power is shared with you, it was shared with you, and the Holy Spirit worked and created faith in your heart. That gospel word of power was pronounced over the waters of your baptism, where Jesus laid claim on you, and he washed you clean and declared you his child. Your Savior speaks. He speaks to you when you open you, God's word, when you open his word, either you yourself personally for devotion or when you open it with your, your spouse, your husband, your wife, or a boyfriend, a girlfriend, or your children. There is your God powerfully at work in his word, strengthening and nourishing, upholding, upholding you, enriching your faith, and, and shoring up and building a saving trust in him reminding you of his goodness. When your Savior speaks, the blind see and the deaf hear. When your Savior speaks, the dead are raised and sins are forgiven. When your Savior speaks, the devil and his cronies flee. They run away like a dog, with their tail tucked between their legs. Because when your Savior speaks, he speaks with power. That's the Savior that's in your corner. That's the Savior who went toe-to-toe with death, he went face-to-face with Satan, and he won. So when Satan throws your sins back in your face. When he would come at you and accuse you of all of the things that you've done and accuse you of your guilt and your shame and the mistakes and the sins that you've made and say that you, by virtue of those things, that you are disqualified from God and his grace, that you are too broken to be fixed, too sick to be healed, too sinful to be forgiven. You can tell them to shut up. You can tell them to get lost. You can tell them that you have a Savior who died for you. You can tell them that you have a Savior who rose from you and reigns for you and rules all things. And at his name, every knee will bow and his name, every tongue will confess and acknowledge that he is Lord and King of all. And that Savior, he speaks in your defense. That's the Savior in your corner. And when he speaks, he speaks with power. Amen.
Let's go to our God in prayer. Almighty and eternal Father, you have shown your grace, power, and glory to the world by the sending of your Son, Jesus. Continue to guide the work of the church. Shield us from harm. Keep us from evil. Help your church to persevere in the faith. Proclaim your word and truth and love all that we, your church, graciously engage our world with the life-giving gospel of your Son. That we make the most of every opportunity and that we're always ready to give the reason for the hope that we have in Jesus. Help each of us to faithfully carry out the work that you have called and equipped us to do. Keep us from bickering and fighting with one another during this time of stress, lest we give Satan a toehold in our homes or in our church. Work in our hearts a heart of patience that model your son, not seeking to be served, but to serve. Fill us with a steadfast trust in you that you, our Father, will, prote will protect, provide, and preserve your children. Move our hearts to give freely as you freely give to us. May we, with our gifts and talents and treasures, continue to support the ministry of the church so more people come to know the eternal joy, hope, and peace that we have now and forever in your Son, Jesus. We pray especially today for our brothers and sisters in our sister synod, the Evangelical Lutheran Synod, as they mourn the sudden death of their synod president, John Molstead. We give you thanks for bringing him to faith, for carrying him through his ministry, and equipping him and sustaining him to be a faithful under-shepherd for your people. We pray for the Molstead family. Comfort them in their grief. You are not a God who is far away in times of hardship and heartache, but a God who is intimately near. Remind them that your son is and always will be the resurrection and the life. Because he lives, we also will live. Teach us all, Lord, to number our days aright. 
And may we all with perseverance run the race that you have marked out for us until the day you in wisdom call us home to be with you. All this we pray in your son Jesus' saving holy name and pray also the prayer that you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Good morning again. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday morning for worship today. I hope and pray that you were edified and uplifted, uh, rejoicing in our Savior Jesus, our God and Redeemer, who when he speaks and he proclaims and uh, your freedom and your forgiveness, there's power behind those words because it's your God who is saying it. Um, if you haven't done so already, take a moment to fill out our online eConnect card. It's very short. It's very simple. Uh, whether you are a member of our church and you're recording your visit or whether you're a guest or if, uh, 
a first-time visitor and you're checking out Our Shepherd or maybe you stumbled across this on yours or somebody else's Facebook page, um, we want to get connected with you. We want to know that you were able to hang out with us today and we want to find out how best we can serve you during this very unique season uh, that we find ourselves in in America. Um, you can do that um, either by following the link in the description of this video or by going to our website at rshepherdcp.com and you can click on our um, uh, you can either utilize the contact form or if you're watching through our worship webcast, there's a little button there that, that they'll link you to our eConnect card. Very short. Um, maybe you're a member of our congregation and you'd like to schedule an opportunity to hang out and meet with me. Or maybe you're looking to schedule private communion, which um, we, we are offering to members of our church who, uh, who schedule that with me or the head elder of our congregation. But here's a great way to do that. Fill out our eConnect card so we can get connected with you. Um, Maybe you're, a, maybe you're a guest or visitor, or maybe this whole Christianity thing is brand new to you. Um, we have our Pathway to Membership course that is going on right now. We're about to finish one session, but um, I, as your pastor, and maybe your pastor, should you decide to join our church, I'd like to rev up and start another cycle as soon as possible, but I would love it if you would join us for that. Um, you can signify that by filling out our RSVP on our website, again, at rshepherdcp.com. Uh, there you can click on the, the Community section or the Connect to Us section or um, next step section, what, wherever you want to go on the website, and it'll take you to our faith, our, our faith builders pathway to membership page, uh, which is our, our, our Bible study um, that kind of lays out the core components of the Christian faith. It gives us a chance to tell you who we are at Our Shepherd and, and me a chance to share who we are about, and that being Jesus, um, our Savior and our Redeemer. Um, a couple other things too. Um, if the ministry of Our Shepherd is something that you value and appreciate, um, NIPSCO doesn't pay for itself, right? As you all know that. I mean, this, this comes with all other aspects of businesses, even your home. Um, your gift offerings, God uses to, to, to fund and to finance the ministry of our shepherd, to get more of the gospel to more people more often, um, to give us new opportunities. Maybe it's the live stream stuff. For all of you who, who contributed out of your pockets and purses to pay for uh, the new inf uh, technology that we're implementing at our shepherd, um, that's going to be a tremendous blessing, and it's going to be used by God. We're confident that, 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 that God will get more of this content to more people more often as a result of those contributions, and for that, thank you. Um, ways that you can support the ministry of Our Shepherd, you can either do mail-in offerings, um, you just send them to our, our physical address, or you can go to, um, there's, a, there's a, a secure giving portal on our website, so you go to OurShepherdCP.com, click on Give, and then you could do a one-time offering or a re reoccurring monthly or weekly offering as well. A um, couple other things, uh, our Midweek Ruth Bible Study, which um, we are rounding out uh, chapter two, um, the kind of the, the, the lazy approach through the book where we're maybe looking at five to seven verses at a time. We're having a great time doing it and it's been a huge blessing for me. I know it's been a blessing for those who've been able to attend, but we'd love it if you would join too. If you're interested in joining us for our Midweek Ruth Bible Study and rooting yourself in God's word and taking a break uh, midweek from the busyness of your life, we'd love to have you come. Uh, Tuesdays from seven to 8 p.m., you don't even have to get up out of your living room couch. You can watch and attend right from the comfort of your own home. Um, are you eating dinner at that time? Don't worry. Join the meeting, hit mute, and you can listen to the Bible study while you're fixing dinner. We'd still love to have you. One final announcement, and then, uh, and then I'll let you head on off to maybe shovel snow because <laughs> it looks like we still got it coming down outside. Uh, that's what I got scheduled for me this Sunday afternoon. Um, our ministry team will be meeting after a, somewhat of a, a brief hiatus this upcoming Wednesday. Um, and uh, if you don't know what our ministry team is, it's, a, it's, it's kind of our member care team that not only plans in-reach, but also outreach within our congregation. Um, pulling those within our congregation to uh, uh, kind of huddling everybody together and rallying each other, but then also um, taking the gospel to, to those that God has called us to reach out with, with the gospel, uh, that those within our community. Um, and uh, we got a couple things that we got to figure out. Um, one, we want to kind of reinitiate our um, some of our inreach ministries uh, now that we have uh, a new head elder of our congregation. There's a little bit of turnover there that we want to make sure is smooth and, and well transitioned, but also lay out some protocol there. But the other thing that we got to figure out is a year ago, if you can remember that far back, we had our chili cook-off, which was a tremendously awesome outreach event where God brought loads of first-time visitors to our church, and there they heard the gospel, and they got a bowl of chili as well. Um, 
we're obviously, given the current crisis that we're in, we're not able to have the chili cook-off like we had it last year. But we want to do something outreach related. We want to do some outreach initiative during the month of February and we would love it if you at our ministry team meeting would, would, would share some ideas as for what we could do to get more of the gospel to more people more often. Um, so if you're a member of our congregation and you're brand new and you don't, or, or maybe you don't know what the ministry team is, this would be a great opportunity to join. Um, this upcoming Wednesday, check your inbox. I'll be sending an invite out to a Zoom meeting uh, just like we do for the Bible study. Um, it'll, that meeting will be from 7 to 8 p.m. It'll be kind of a short uh, introduction to what the ministry team is, but we'd love it if you would be part of it. Um, that'll be this Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m. I got no further announcements. Um, stay warm, stay safe, um, and uh, maybe make a snowman or two if you're, if you're into that. Uh, and may God richly bless your week, and we'll see you next week for worship.